Well, good morning again. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. In your bulletin it says we are in verses 13 and 14. What do you think I'm going to say? Yep. Well, we are there. We are there. I just don't know if we're going to get that far, honestly. Uh, but we will see. So how are you doing with your homework I gave you last week? Anybody remember? Yeah, write a list of every one of your sins. Anybody doing it? My list is growing immensely. I continue to do it. Many of us say we're not doing it. I don't blame you. I was there, and I struggle as I still wade through making my list. It will never end. But I will tell you what my list does to me. It drives me to my knees. Every second of every day. Let's read our text. We are in a section I've entitled, The Testimony of God's Grace. I don't see an end in the near future in these verses. It is so rich. But let's start reading in verse 12. We looked at this last week where he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet, for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, it is a daunting task to open your word. But Lord Jesus, we love you, and we know that you are a faithful God. I know the promise of your word, where it says that your word will not return void. Father, as I have spent hours after hour, after hour, studying your word. Lord, I am broken more and more every second. And Lord Jesus, as I have a goal to get through two verses this morning, Lord, I just pray that you'd use the things that we look at to accomplish your will. You are an amazing God. Lord, you know that my heart has been heavy this week as wrestle with what's going on in the world and in our community. But Father, you are still on your throne and we will trust you. I just pray that you would teach us your ways so that we may walk in your truth. I pray, Lord, that you would give us an undivided heart. Father, I do not want us to be a church that simply hears the word, but Lord, I, I want to be a church that hears and then applies the word to every second of our lives because we love our God so much. And I pray, Lord, you start with me first and foremost. Lord, you know my prayer for our church and for our community. I ask, God, that you would use the things this morning to accomplish your will for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at our text this morning, which is entitled, The Testimony of God's Grace, I want us to look at three things. One, the need, for, the need for God's grace. Two, the power of God's grace. And three, the response of God's grace. I expect us only to look at the need for God's grace. But I hope to get through all three. The question that I want you to ask yourself, as I've asked myself many times, is how is our lives affected by God's grace and mercy? 
In verse 13, Paul, well, let, you just got to remind yourself. Do you remember two weeks ago or three weeks ago what we talked about? No? Okay, let me remind you. In verse 8, Paul says, But know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul is giving instruction to a young man in the ministry and he says there are these men right remember these men were men who are in leadership in the church those men were most likely elders and Paul tells Timothy as you walk into this lion's den Timothy you need to remember Christ your message is to be a message of love these men aspire to the office of elders these men wanted to be experts in the law and he says they don't understand the law of Moses he said He said, Timothy, let me remind you that the law of Moses is to show you your wretchedness, that you are frail, that you are broken, and that you need a Savior. He said that is the purpose of the law. And then he enters into this section of his personal testimony of the the message of grace. And, And I want us to look at this first portion of verse 13 where we will see the need for grace Paul recounts his testimony he says even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief I want you to see that as we walk through this, I want you to see the connection that the Apostle Paul makes to the previous verses about the law of Moses. Because as Paul uses this trilogy to describe his need for grace, he says he's a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. This trilogy is a progression through the Ten Commandments. And I hope to show you that. He says formally, the word formally, proteros, it's an adverb. It means previously or before. It has the idea that it denotes a period of time preceding another period of time. That was deep, wasn't it? It Makes me think of passages like Ephesians chapter 4. You can turn there if you want. But in in Ephesians chapter 4, he says... Verse 17, he talks about the walk of a believer. He says in verse 17, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the hardness of their heart. Okay, let me stop. Let me tell you honestly what's going on. I'll be really, really honest. So yesterday, I was like, Lord, I'm done being a pastor. And it was just, I I was overwhelmed. And to be honest, I don't know why that happened. I was up almost all night. And I'm not sure why that happened, except my daughter came down the stairs throwing up. And I was like, what in the world? But God's grace has just blown me out of the water. My daughter's not contagious. Don't panic, please. I don't know why she did it. She's great. She's fine. But I've just been so overwhelmed that why would God take such some dirty, rotten sinner such as myself and say, you go do this. You go pastor a church. Yeah, right. And it's just been hard. So maybe we'll just do communion and go home. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, I lost my spot. I'm sorry. You got to bear with me. It's going to be a slow morning, maybe. But in, but in verse, verse 19, it says, And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, there it was, you see it? In your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, 
which is being corrupt in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And it has the same idea as Paul uses that word in verse 12 or verse 13. He says, even though I was formerly, he recalls to mind his need for grace. We can see the same Greek word in Hebrews 10.32 where he says, but remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of suffering? In 1 Peter 1.14, Peter is writing to believers who are suffering. And he says in verse 14, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Paul is reminding himself of his, his past life in the past. And what does he say? He says, let me remind you of the need for grace in my life. He says, he uses this first word. And I want you to take note of the progression. He says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer. Blasphemos, it's an adjective. It's describing the noun, which is Paul himself. It is the I. In, one of, in a systematic theology book that I was reading this week, it says blasphemy is the irreverent and insulting or slanderous expressions against God. This is the Apostle Paul, as he reminds himself of his need for grace. The root word means slandering, blaspheming. It is used in the following ways. It can mean blasphemous, revilers, or reviling. How about, how about the verse in, in Acts chapter 6? If we wanted to look at the, the biography of, of Paul's life. It says in Acts chapter 6, verse 11, Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. These, these are just the different times the Greek word is used. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, when, when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, But realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. Do you all remember that? Difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. Uses the word revilers. Paul previously had explained to Timothy the purpose of the law by showing the connection to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and in the Decalogue in Deuteronomy chapter 5. He reminds them, he shows them the connection of the law of Moses to the Ten Commandments. But here, the word blasphemy. Paul says, formerly I was a blasphemer. That means to, to have irreverent and insulting or slanderous, slanderous expressions against God. What are the first several commandments about? Your relationship to God, right? Paul says, look at me. Look at me, I spoke like that against God. The, the next thing he goes on to, he says in verse 13, he says that he was a, a persecutor. He said, I was a blasphemer. I, I spoke badly against God, breaking the first several of the Ten Commandments. But then he says, I was a persecutor. This is the only time that the Greek word is used in all of Scripture. I looked it up in the dictionary just to see what they, what they would say and how they would define the word persecutor. This is what the World Wide Web says as it defines the word. He says it is a person who persecutes someone. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> Especially for their race or political or religious belief. Or it says it's a person who harasses or annoys someone persistently. So I did, I did some digging in the Word of God. So, so based on that definition, do you think that Paul did that at all? Where, where maybe he harassed or annoyed somebody persistently? Let's start in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. 
So do you remember what happened at the end of chapter 7? You have Stephen, right? He was put to death. Where was, where was Saul? Paul, he was holding the, the, the cloaks. Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him, Stephen, to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Here it is. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Now maybe I'm going too far, but as he was doing that, do you think maybe there were some words of harassment going on? I think there was. Look at Acts chapter 9 verse 1. It says there, and now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was not only a blasphemer, but he was a persecutor. How about in Acts 22? Just listen to this. Verse 3, Paul says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prison as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them also, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. How about in Galatians 1.13? For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. The Apostle Paul understood his need for grace, didn't he? And I don't know about you, but I can speak for myself that oftentimes I take grace for granted way too often. And that's why I have my list of sins going. I realize I'm never going to finish it. I get that. But what, what my list does is it drives me to my knees and drives me to tears when I realize that my God has forgiven me of my past, present, and future sin. And I firmly believe that as believers, we still have a responsibility to confess our sins, even when we commit them. It's interesting when you think about the Ten Commandments. The first several deal with what? Your relationship to God. And the next section deals with what? Your relationship to people. Well, as Paul shared his testimony, he says, I was a blasphemer. He said, I had an issue with the way that I communicated and I talked about my God. He said, I messed up. And then what does he say? He says, I persecuted. That is how he specifically uh, um, responded to people, right? He persecuted them. But it doesn't even stop there. It says that he was a violent aggressor. He was a violent aggressor. Well, what does that mean? He was insolent. He was a violent man. He was despiteful. He was overbearing. Do you think he did that when he was doing what he thought was the right thing and dealing with the Christians, trying to get them off the face of the earth? He was a passionate man. He was all in. He was overbearing for what he believed was right. Huh, we find the same Greek word in Romans chapter 1. 
Remember Romans chapter 1 tells us everybody knows there's a God. Everybody's without excuse because we know that God exists. Look out your window. Look at the mountain. It demands a creator. We can look at the teleological, anthropological, cosmological, philosophical proofs that there is a God. We know that there's a God. Our world demands that there is a God. But in Romans chapter 1, it says several times in there that God has given them over, right? He's given them over to their desires. They're not going to believe there's a God. They're going to deny me. And it says he's given them over. If we had time, we could read verses 28 to 32. But it uses the word insolent, which is the same Greek root word. How about in Acts 26, 9? It says, so then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously, ferociously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. I think when Paul understands his need for God's grace, that affected his life, didn't it? And when I realize my need for God's grace and what God has done for me, that gets me all the more excited to live for my God. You know what we talked about in the youth, in the youth this morning? I don't know how God works this out. But we were in Matthew chapter 9, the last two verses. And you know what it says? Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. What? But the workers are few. And then we end up in 1 Timothy and we go, look at our need for grace. And when we understand, we truly, biblically understand our need for God's grace, then that drives us to what? I believe it drives us to go into the harvest and don't shut up about Jesus. Right? Right? When I understand my need for God's grace, you're not going to find me not talking about my Jesus because I love him. And then it's on a communion Sunday. I love how God works, don't you? Sometimes I don't when it deals with me. All right, we're going to see. I'm going to try to get through all of these. Look at the end of verse 13. He says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, then he says, yet I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. This is a difficult portion. We'll start with the first part. He says, yet I was shown mercy. This is the power of grace. Paul was a, he was a bad dude, wasn't he? but I think we could all put our names in there. I was a bad dude. I am a bad dude. If you're a lady, you could be a bad dudette. That's okay. He says, I was shown mercy. Elio is the Greek word. It's a verb, eris tense, eris voice, passive, indicative, First person, singular, is a finite verb. I don't know a lot about grammar. But it sure seems to me that as you look at the grammatical content, or the grammatical, or the grammar in this situation, this is an event that took place in the past. God showed his mercy in the past. We can just stop right there for the day. The, the fact that God showed his mercy in eternity past, that ought to blow our minds if we meditate on that for a lifetime. God knows everything, past, present, and future, and God demonstrated, God showed his mercy in eternity past, knowing every sin that I would ever commit, and God showed mercy. Keep working on your sin list. What is mercy? Mercy differs from grace in that grace removes the guilt, while mercy takes away the misery caused by sin. Did you get that? 
Mercy differs from grace in that grace removes the guilt while mercy takes away the misery caused by sin. How about this? To show kindness. To have compassion. Mercy is... God's mercy describes him as perfectly having deep compassion for creatures, such that he demonstrates benevolent goodness to those in a pitiable or miserable condition, even though they do not deserve it. This is from a systematic theology book, Biblical Doctrine. I thought about taking up the next eight weeks just on mercy, but I don't want to do that. Listen to this list that really shows the mercy of God. The mercy of God is shown as a perfect attribute of God. We can look, I, I can give you the verses later. God's mercy, it is manifold. God's mercy does not fail. God's mercy is an aspect of God's parental affection and care. It is given to sinners after divine chastening. God is called the Father of mercies. God showed His mercy in Christ. Christ showed the mercy of God in His life on earth. And as the great high priest in heaven, God gives mercy by providing salvation in all its aspects. Look at your list of sins. Or just think about how sinful you are. Paul did. Then he says, yet I was shown Mercy. I was shown deep compassion. Does that blow your mind? I don't know. If it doesn't blow your mind, you need to spend some time studying the word mercy this week. And your sin. Because this blows my mind. As I'm working on my list of sins, it, I'm not doing it for any particular reason except for helping me understand the greatness of God's mercy. In my life. But he says, look at what he says. I think we're at the end of verse 13. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The question is, what, what does that mean? And I, I, I don't have time to go through it and try to explain and do all of that. But do you remember the unpardonable sin? Yes? And what is that? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So did Paul blaspheme the Holy Spirit when it says in verse 13 that he was a blasphemer? What does that mean? I'm not prepared to defend it fully up here. But does it mean that, that God's mercy was limited in saving the Apostle Paul? No. No. No, I don't believe so. Nor, nor do I think that this phrase, I acted ignorantly in unbelief, means that Paul is giving an excuse for his sin. Some people would say that, he, well, he's just not taking ownership for his sin. I don't think that's what he's saying. He really has the idea of, of not knowing. Let me just read this quote to you. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Paul pleads ignorance regarding his persecution of Christians in his early years. He insisted that if that phase of his life had not been done in ignorance, he would not have received the mercy and been appointed to his present ministry. This is not to say, however, that ignorance is an excuse for sin or serves to protect one from guilt. On the contrary, specific Old Testament sacrifices were required for sins committed in ignorance. Paul himself needed God's forgiving mercy for his persecuting days. 
I believe what Paul did uh, before Christ, he thought that that was right, didn't he? He was convinced that that was the right thing for him to do. And I could show you from the Old Testament that when a, a person sinned unintentionally, they were required to offer a sacrifice. We can look at Leviticus 4, 2, and 3. We can look at Leviticus 4, 27, and 28. Let me ask you this. Can you think of a time that you acted or behaved in a way that you did not know was wrong? No? Let me give you an example. I was thinking about this. When Caleb was really little, I had a truck that my uncle had given me. It was a GMC Sierra. It was old. It was a stick shift. And he loved to get in the car and play. I thought it was fine. Until I looked up. Now, you all know that I can't run. So this, just, this was funny. So I looked up. Caleb was playing around on the bench, right? And he accidentally kicked the stick shift, knocked it into neutral, and the truck begins to roll. And I can't catch it, right? And so it goes down our driveway. It goes across the road. It goes into my neighbor's yard. They were our friends, kind of. And it hits the curb, and it bounces up into the yard, and it stops. I was like, thank you, Lord, because I was going to watch him go like, and I don't know where, Walmart, I don't know where he's going. But as I was thinking about this idea where Paul says, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, he was doing what he really thought was right. He thought it was okay. He, he was sold out and he thought that he had to do this. He acted ignorantly just like I allowed, Caleb had no idea what he's doing in the truck. I didn't have any problem with it. But then he never played in the truck after that, right? He didn't know that he shouldn't be doing that. And dumb me, let him do it. But I just want you to see the surface of the power of grace that God showed his mercy to Paul. What does it say? Verse 14. Oh, yeah, we got to we got to start verse 14. God don't know how to stop in the middle. He says, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. The, the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. This is so cool. Grace is the same root word that is used in verse 12. Look at verse 12. And it uses the word thank. That's, it's the same root word. In verse 12, it was talking about it was the favor on the part of the giver when, where it uses thanks on the part of the receiver. Actually, I said that wrong. When it says in verse 14, it says, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. When it says grace in verse 14, it's speaking of the Lord in its unmerited favor. And when it says thanks in verse 12, it's speaking of that of the giver. He's thankful because of what he has received. But he, the neat thing is he says, the grace of our Lord. Grace, what is grace? Grace may be defined as the unmerited or undeserving favor of God to those who are under condemnation. The New Testament word, cheris, particularly focuses on the provision of salvation in Christ. We have two types of grace. We have common grace and we have efficacious grace. Are you familiar with those terms? Okay. Common grace is God's unmerited favor to all mankind in providing sunshine, rainfall, food, and clothing. That is common grace. It's available to all mankind. Efficacious grace some would use different terms, irresistible or special. This is God's sovereign work in effectively calling some to salvation. Now, God knows who's going to be saved, right? God knows that. He knows all things, past, present, and future. But efficacious grace is the grace that God shows in bringing someone to himself. Another, uh, another way to say it is something like this. One guy describes it as this. God's grace describes God as perfectly bestowing favor on those who cannot merit it because they have forsaken it and are under the sentence of divine condemnation. Grace is simply favor. Favor. 
Well, how do we see God's grace? This list summarizes the biblical teaching on the grace of God. Here we go. God's grace, its object is mainly God's people. Israel was chosen and blessed by God due to only God's grace. God's grace is abundant. In the New Testament, God's grace is especially His free, unmerited favor towards sinners and giving them salvation from sin. God's grace is manifested in Jesus Christ. God's gifts of spiritual and earthly blessing are called grace. God's grace is unmerited. It does not allow for works of merit. Wearsby says this, the key words, mercy and grace. God in His mercy did not give Paul what he did deserve. Instead, God in His grace gave Paul what he did not deserve. Grace and mercy are God's love in action. God's love paying a price to save lost sinners. If that doesn't get you excited, nothing in the world will. Nothing, I promise you. Nothing will. Let's quickly... Oh, you know what? No, I can't. Seven pages of notes. Y'all, we won't get out until one. No, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. We'll stop there. But we've got to talk about the so what, right? So what? What does this mean? How is your life affected by God's grace and mercy? Last week, you guys know this, I encourage you to start making a list of your sins that you've committed. That's hard. I know it's hard. I'm struggling with it. But y'all, what it's done for me, it's driven me to my knees in tears. That my God, our God is so amazing that He forgave me. He showed me mercy. He showed me grace all the time. Our need for grace and the power of grace ought to cause us to fall on our faces before God in thankfulness. Don't you think? Do you agree with that? What can we do? Let me challenge you. The joy, because of our need for grace and the power of grace that God has shown me, the the joy ought to be beaming through unending smiles at work, at home, at the doctor's office, on the operating table, in the community, among your friends, among your church family. The list goes on and on, my friends. The joy ought to be shown through my life, your life, when life is going well, when life is hard, when life seems to be more than I can bear, when life is spinning out of control, when our world seems to be breaking at the seams, we ought to be smiling like crazy because we serve a risen Savior and He's in the world today, right? May we never forget God's grace. May we never forget our need for grace. May we never forget the power of grace. May we never forget the mercy and grace that our God has shown us. If you're here and you don't know Christ, my challenge is simple. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. If you don't know Christ, you need to come to understand that salvation is is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone.